hindsight, that was a mistake. No, that ascot was a mistake. It's a cravat. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in the first episode of The Continental, the brand new Peacock series set in the world of John Wick. Oh boy, are we doing another John Wick? I'm gonna grab my suit. You grab that suit, buddy. So guys, if you've watched any of our John Wick videos in the past, then you know that these movies are about more than just cool cars and amazing action sequences. Oh, I'm much more than that. This franchise exists in a hyperbolic reality defined by rules and a hierarchy of authority. Hydraulic reality? What are they bumping low riders in the parking Lot? No, Doug, a hyperbolic reality, meaning that while the world looks normal, in reality, it's all an act. In the films, everybody's well aware of the high table and their network of assassins, cab drivers. The Continental. Can you see that he's received by the concierge? Yes, sir, Mr. Wick. The homeless. Tell him it's John Wick. Hell, even civilians are completely unbothered when firefights break out around them and they just keep dancing. However, The Continental is set in the 1970s, nearly 45 years before all of that, and the world around it seems much less organized, almost as if the high table is still very much growing in its power. The first episode is meant to introduce Frankie, Winston's brother. Now, it's clear that Frankie is this series' John Wick. They both have the suit, the hair, a lover they want to start over with, and they're both driven by their own sense of what is right. We start with the scene from 1955, with little Winston and Frankie in an interrogation room, seemingly about to be questioned for something they did, which is insinuated to be arson, judging by the Molotov cocktail that flies across the screen just before the scene begins. Frankie is telling Winston, I did it, you got that? Which not only establishes him as a martyr for his brother, but also alludes to the episode's ending. Frankie! We then meet an older Frankie looking very Keanu-tastic, walking away from a restricted floor in the Continental. When somebody tells him he's not supposed to be down there, he says, Not supposed to be bald and married ladies either. And this actually foreshadows his brother doing exactly that later in the episode. He then walks into a classic John Wick red monochromatic party filled with foreshadowing and symbolism. The whole scene is bathed in red lighting, just like the scene in the red circle from John Wick chapter one, or the scene from the Osaka Kenental in chapter four. Typically, when we see these red scenes, we know that bloodshed is soon to come. Everyone in this room knows Frankie well, calling out his name from the balconies. <laughs> We also see not one, but two pairs of twins in the club, which is not only a clear call out to the siblings focus of this first episode, but also foreshadows Frankie's own executioners at the end of the episode. Now the entire episode is focused on Winston and Frankie's complicated relationship and the vulnerability that family can bring you in this kind of world. I mean, the episode is titled Brothers in Arms. We also see a guy with a monkey on his back doing a little nose skiing who Frankie steals a bottle of champagne from while he's distracted, which is yet another allusion to the episode's ending where a monkey is used as a symbol for deception. I mean, that makes sense since in Christian art, monkeys are often used to represent sin and temptation. And in some Native American cultures, monkeys are associated with deceit and trickery. Wait, how do you know all that. Animal symbology is my speciality. You know what? Fair enough. And there's plenty of animal symbology in this story, including this horse on the dance floor. Now, horses typically represent some kind of relationship to order in the John Wick world, which we will see repeated a few times in this episode. Here, it's meant to represent how order has taken a backseat tonight in celebration of the new year, something that Frankie will soon take advantage of. We also get introduced to Cormac. Hey, Frankie, my boy. They share a shot of vodka, specifically giving cheers to family. You don't turn your back on that. Reiterating the episode's theme once again in the most John Wick of ways. Family. But Frankie immediately spits it out, showing his true feelings for Cormac. He tosses a single coin to the coat check on the way out, which is our first indication that he is indeed an assassin under the high table. What's the high table? Well, everything in the world of John Wick is run by a mysterious shadow council known as the high table. The Wick movies have shown us some of their members, but for the most part, they remain a mystery. Essentially, they run the entire network of assassins. And this moment confirms that Frankie is indeed part of that network. Frankie heads to the subway, and everything in these scenes shows how different this New York is from the one that John Wick inhabits. It's covered in graffiti, people are vomiting in the streets and throwing parties in the subway terminal. The train number is 3468, which could mean a couple of things. First, this is an angel number, meaning that it's a number that it can, in some context, have spiritual meaning. As an angel number, 3468 means follow your intuition. Additionally, if you add up the numbers, you get 21 or blackjack. Now, Wick's world constantly uses games as a metaphor, so this could be referring to the fact that his next move will be a win over the high table. Now, while most of the graffiti is simply 
simply symbolic of the chaotic nature of NYC on New Year's Eve. If you zoom in into this one here and flip it upside down and reverse it, you will see that it reads your Samadre, which is Latin for your mom. Frankie then pulls off a very Ocean's Eleven-like heist scene, using a train to rip off the door of the Continental Vault, which may be the very same vault that Winston hides in at the climax of Chapter 3. In the vault, we finally see the MacGuffin of this series, the coin press. Yeah, what's so important about a coin press anyways? Well, this press specifically creates the coins that act as the secret currency for the High Tables network. These coins are used for everything, from drinks at the bar, or as a bounty for taking someone's life. We saw a bit of this coin making process in the Casablanca scene from Wick Chapter 3. See that coin? The first coin ever minted in this facility. But this press appears to be the one that started it all. Of course, then Frankie is betrayed, bringing some serious panic to the disco above them. I chime in with the guards come down and yet another red light comes on. This time, letting guests know that the Continental is now open for business. In other words, people can now kill on Continental grounds. Now, one of the main rules of the Wickverse is that you cannot conduct business on the grounds of the Continental. But when that light's on, everything is fair game. Which brings us to our first major gunfight of the show. Everything about this scene feels so incredibly John Wick. The scenes are action-packed, and in classic John Wick style, he never takes more shots than his magazine can hold. We even see his gun click on the 16th shot right before throwing away the empty magazine at another enemy, which is just brilliant attention to detail. After jumping from the window, he narrowly escapes in not just a taxi cab, but the taxi cab. Wait, as in Robert De Niro's taxi cab? The one and only. The director of this episode was a huge fan of the movie Taxi Driver, and he wanted to be sure that the getaway car was an exact replica. All the way down to the license plate number. After that, we get one heck of an intro sequence filled with past wick references, Easter eggs, and animal symbology. One shot shows a red car taking out a circle of gunmen around it, which is visually opposite of how Perkins was killed in John Wick 1 for violating the Continental's rules. Next, we see snakes surrounding the hotel. Like monkeys, snakes often symbolize deceit and evil, especially in a biblical context. We also see Mrs. Davenport wearing snake earrings in the scene immediately following this one, when she's trying to deceive her own husband. We also have a scene full of rats, which could be a symbol for the Bowery. What's the Bowery? Well, it's a neighborhood in New York, but it's also a network of homeless people that live in New York's underground, the leader of which is the one who rehabilitated John the first time that he died. We met and you gave me a gift. The gift that would make me a king. Now, while we didn't see them in this episode, we likely will down the line. How do we know they're coming? They're coming. Next, we see a small red canary, which is the same one seen outside of Cormac's window in later scenes, surrounded by two horses, which we discussed the symbology of earlier. We also see the word inimicus, which is Latin for enemy, fitting since this series loves its Latin phrases. There's also a violin-gun hybrid scene, which could very well be a callback to the one used by an assassin in John Wick 3. And of course, it ends with the monkey statue that we see in the final scene of the episode. Now, with all our introductions out of the way, we meet Winston in London. I think it's important to note that this establishes Winston before he's under the rule of the high table. He's willing to bend the rules and the truth to get exactly what he wants, which shows how much he's changed by the time we see him in chapter one. He says, my job is to see the future, which is true. He even knows how the meeting will likely end. Thus, he institutes his own backup plan with Mrs. Davenport and her symbolic snake earrings. Wire the money. After being kidnapped and brought to New York City, we get a much more detailed look into Cormac, who is utterly terrifying, and not just because he's being played by real-life villain Mel Gibson. Oogly moogly, bitch! Well, while he upholds the rules, he has little respect for them. Oh, yeah, the fucking rules, yeah. Mm which feels like a mirror to the kind of manager Winston will be in the future. His room is filled with horses, which is fitting for the man who runs the hotel. Right, because he's the standard bearer for order within the Continental, and so the horse symbology works here as well. Exactly. Also interesting to note that as intimidating as it is for Cormac to convince his failed henchmen to jump to their death, we've also seen John take this same fall and survive. You reap, baby. Can't kill me. It's also ironic that he lands next to the boxes that Frankie landed in when he escaped the Continental just a few scenes prior. Aim for the bushes. It's like the guy almost could have made it if he just would have stuck the landing a little bit better. I made a mistake. Even after their meeting, we can see someone hosing the blood off the street with an officer on horseback walking right through the mess, reiterating that all these actions are well within this world's rules. And then we meet KD, played by Michelle Prada, who presents a really interesting character for this universe. She's a detective, and she's committed to the truth and what is right, not the rules. Hence why she's sleeping with a married man who's also her boss, and why she smears dog shit on that one guy's car as justice for him leaving it there every single day. I may have deserved that. Now, KD is not like the cops we've seen in John Wick before. In chapter one, we see an officer who checks in on Wick and not only knows who he is, but does nothing about the full-on horror scene in his living room that's behind him. You, uh, working again? 
No, I'm just sorting some stuff out. In the films, the cops are completely aware of the high table and their network's actions, and they stay out of their business, clearly not how they operated in the 1970s. When KD finally visits the Continental, she is clearly unaware of how the hotel operates, which is why she uses cash instead of the traditional coin, which seems to trigger everyone in the room. But this clearly is not true of all law enforcement, as Mayhew is very much in the know, and he warns her that they have no authority there later in the episode. Then we meet our gun-running friends from the dojo as they escape the clutches of the Russian mob, which which of course is the most classic John Wick villain of all time. By finishing what I started. What the fuck did he hear? F word I say. Winston meets up with his buddy Charles, and after getting some intel, he gives him a car, the classic black Mustang Boss 348, and it looks nearly identical to John's car from Chapter One. He also says, "I need you to hear me right now, okay? This is the love of my life." Which is a callback to Helen's letter to Wick about his own car. But you still need something, someone to love. So start with this, because the card doesn't count. We also get a scene with the bigger bat of the series, the Adjudicator. Er, what's an Adjudicator? Well, an Adjudicator is someone who makes a formal decision based on a problem, like a judge. In Wick's world, they serve as direct agents to the high table. And in Chapter 3, another Adjudicator was one of the main antagonists. Let me be clear, I am here to adjudge you. The adjudicator confirmed that the press predates the Roman Empire, which means that this establishment goes way further back than we ever thought. Unlike other adjudicators, this one wears a mask, and while we may not know exactly why just yet, it definitely makes her all the more intimidating. When we return to Winston, he's back in his car in search of his brother. Now, he passes a poster that says, Be Seeing You with Marilyn Monroe on it, which references the phrase used by the assassins throughout John Wick, and it also has a much deeper meaning. Yeah, don't they say that like all the time in the movies? Well, what's that about? Well, well, whenever the high table assassins part ways, they always say, be seeing you, which has a number of meanings. So be it could be a reference to The Prisoner, which is a really trippy British TV show from the late 1960s. It's a really complicated story, but basically a Secret Service agent quits his job and is relocated to a Twilight Zone as community. The citizens of the community would say, be seeing you instead of goodbye. Be seeing you as a showcase of their forced complicity to a different power and status quo. The assassins in Wick's world do the same thing to show a similar relationship to the high table. There are no goodbyes because there is no leaving. And it could also mean that they will see you in hell, which is why they also say it to their fellow assassins as they die. Be seeing you, Dom. Be seeing you. Winston is finally able to track his brother down to a movie theater, just like how John returned to his family, who also happened to be hiding out in a theater in Chapter 3. Now, here is where Frankie's parallels to John get even stronger. He's trying to build a new life with his wife, Yen. Yeah, man. Oh, that go and talk. Okay. Mình định bắt đầu cuộc sống gia đình mà and escape his obligations to the high table, just as John was in chapter one. They even have a vase full of daisies on the table, which Yen takes with them as they escape the theater. Wait, so what's so special about the flowers? Well, Helen, John's wife, who died before the events of chapter one, loved daisies. There's even a daisy on the card that she leaves John, and it's why John named their first dog Daisy. Daisy's death is what spurred John into his vengeful killing spree, which again is foreshadowing the end of this episode. Daisy. Winston even offers him a chance to restart. Well, I have money, Frankie, a lot of it right now. I can buy you that way out that you were robbed of. You can go anywhere you want. You can be anyone you want. Just like how he gave John a head start before he was officially made excommunicado in Chapter 3. I made him excommunicado. But not before you gave him an hour to escape. You keep saying these Latin phrases like anybody knows what they mean. Well, Cormac explains it perfectly right here. That's Latin for your f then Winston unintentionally betrays his brother by leading Cormac's men right to him, which mirrors his betrayal of John at the end of Chapter 3. Now, of course, after a few more character-building conversations and some missing pieces filled in by KD, one of Charlie's friends betrays the crew. I'm not about me. And then they set off on another incredible chase sequence that ends with their beautiful Mustang flipped upside down in front of a neon sign reading, Jesus Saves. Perfectly ironic for this near-death situation. We get a few more awesome hallway fights, and then they end up on the roof, where Frankie is forced to sacrifice himself for the rest of the crew with the red neon cross right next to his body, symbolizing his martyrdom. The final scene shows Cormac opening the skeleton box, only to find our monkey friend from the title screen in full-fingered glory, which you can actually see Frankie steal from Charlie's trailer earlier in the show. Brother. That was me being a big brother. 
Now, this episode not only fleshes out what Wix world was like before Winston was running things at the Continental, but also why Winston has such a soft spot for John. He sees Frankie in John. To be honest, it would be hard not to with the ungodly amount of parallels between these two characters. Now, this also sets Winston up for a classic John Wick style revenge sequence. The episode even ends with him saying, I need guns. Lots of guns. Which is the exact same line used by Wick in chapter three. Guns. Lots of guns. The Continental as a series seems much more focused on world building rather than the sheer action driven narrative of the films, which is why some people may have been critical of it. But if you're somebody like me who loves exploring these wacky realities, it is a lot of fun and I cannot wait to see what happens next. Well guys, that's everything we found, but I want to hear from you. What did you think of the Continental? Is it hitting for you the same way it's hitting for us? Any details we missed, you can let us know in the comments or at me on Twitter at Ryan Airy, or you can at the writer of this episode, Dotson Sites at Roos Bain. And if it's your first time here guys, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.